The 360 on Energy and Carbon, hosted by 360 Energy. On today's episode, we are joined by Stephen Shork. Stephen Shork is a highly acclaimed speaker who is widely recognized for his ability to integrate vast arrays of compelling information into dynamic and succinct market views. His presentations include overviews of the most pressing issues affecting the energy sector and context within which to evaluate market action. Now let's get into the episode with Stephen. Welcome back, Dave and John. Great to be back. It's uh, a great week shaping up and looking forward to this session as well. As am I. So today we're joined by Stephen Shork, editor and co-founder at The Shork Group. Welcome, Stephen. It's great to be back. Thank you, guys. So, Stephen, let me kick this off. And for our listeners, this is the third year that Stephen's been with us. And he always brings a, a depth of knowledge and information about the uh, energy markets. So, again, I'm really looking forward to this. So, let me kick this off, Stephen. What changes have, have you seen in the past year since we last spoke to you about the oil and gas market? Well, certainly. And we'll start off with the obvious one, uh, the unforeseeable end to the Russia-Ukraine war and what that potentially means. That continues to be a driver in the market, continues to set up volatility. But obviously, what we've seen transpire over the past five or so weeks is the situation, of course, in the Gaza Strip. So I, I want to be clear on this, that this is not a war between Israel and Hamas. This is not a war that is going to be contained to a small strip of land between Egypt and Israel. This is a war between Israel and Iran, and, and, and yes, Iran. Uh, we have Israel now fighting the terrorist Hydra, Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis, all three designated terrorist groups by the United States that are completely backed by Iran. So we are sitting on a potential powder keg that the market, for whatever reason, has yet to price in. Keep in mind, what we can see escalate quickly in that region, should Iran come into the fold and, and drop their thinly disguised war against Iran and go for all out confrontation, of course, is something that will dwarf the catastrophes that we saw in the 1973 Arab oil, uh, excuse me, 1973 Yom Kippur War and the subsequent Arab oil embargo, the Iraq and Iran wars and the Persian Gulf tanker wars of the 1980s, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in 1990, and subsequent Persian Gulf Wars in 1991, 2003, and 2011. So what we're seeing here now is that should Iran, and they don't even have to come in in an overt way, but of course the greatest choke point for the flow of oil around the world, 40% of it which flows out of the Persian Gulf, has to go through a 40-mile stretch of the Strait of Hormuz to get to the global market. Should Iran mine it or try to block that flow, then yes, we're going to see a significant disruption to the flow of oil, uh, which will, of course, have a knock on to every other energy market. And yet, as I said, I don't understand why the market is not pricing in this very real possibility. So, yes, that would be I think that is the elephant in the room. And, and every other change that we've seen since then is, is minor compared to uh, the volatility that we're, we're sitting on at this point. I just wanted to pick up on that, uh, Stephen. And, and uh, you're right. I mean, listening and watching to the, to the energy markets, looking at the oil markets, that the, the price has somewhat dropped somewhat in the last yeah. week or so when, when you think of all this possible blockage or issues that you're describing. It, it's amazing. Um, you know, is, is that a factor of... Is there other factors that are impacting? Is it also possibly an economy issue that they're concerned about as well going forward, I wonder? It could be. And I think that is what's holding prices back at this point. As you just said, yesterday and as of trading, recent trading, oil prices, both on the Nymex WTI market in the U.S. and the ICE Brent market, which is more of a global benchmark, are now lower today than they were on October 6th, the weekend right before, the day, I should say, right before the massacre in, in southern Israel. So yes, to your point, there, there could be other factors, but I've been around the block a, a few times and we've known about the potential of economic pullback 
Uh, I think the bullish thesis coming into this year was that China, demand in China was going to come back and that was going to propel oil prices back well above $100 a barrel. Of course, that never occurred because China, uh, as it turns out, economically has a lot more issues than the market was banking on uh, just about six, nine months ago. So, but I think that's already been priced in. So, and I think the likelihood of further economic contraction has been priced in. And now the mantra has been the Fed and some of the talking heads on Wall Street, they were talking about recession and, and it, the conversation wasn't, are we going to in recession? The question was, is it going to be a soft landing or a hard landing? We're not hearing that chatter anymore. So, you know, perhaps they're right, perhaps they're wrong, but we have to believe in efficient markets and, and the economic specter has been out there now for over a year. It has been priced in, again, to what I'm thinking, the premium, the risk premium on geopolitics has not been priced in. Uh, I actually wrote a piece the other day as, as to why. And now, now, granted, you're going to have to put your tinfoil hats on because this is a, a conspiracy theory. But as Mark Twain said, fiction can, can, is often uh, stranger than reality because uh, fiction is bound by our imaginations, the logical bounds of our imagination. Reality occurs that's something that we cannot conceive. So what can we cannot conceive right now? Well, is there another, is it economic concerns or is there another actor playing into this market? That is to say, do we have a version of the plunge protection team, which was initiated by the Reagan administration following the 87 stock market crash? And that plunge protection team, which, which is a, a term coined by the Washington Post about leading people in finance and government that advise since then every single White House on policies to try to mitigate or offset economic bedlam. And do we have something that, that at work right now? And, and I euphemistically call it the League of Extraordinary Market Shamans. Are, are they at play right now? Or are, are they doing something behind the scenes that we watch in the markets are not seeing? Again, I mean, this is just, I'm trying to use a little bit of uh, tongue in cheek imagination, but I, I gotta tell you guys, I'm scratching my head that we're, we're not significantly higher. In fact, we're, we're lower now than before this war broke out. And to me, when we look at the analogs, again, going back to the fallout of the Yom Kippur War, the fallout of the Persian tanker war, wars and so forth, that's all led to chaos and higher prices. And, and we're seeing the act absolute lows. We're seeing no volatility because the market has been moving steadily lower. So to me, that risk is, is so great. I would not be selling, well, I am not selling into this uh, weakness in the market. I'd, I'm on the sidelines. I'd rather miss it than, than jump on the bandwagon and wake up one morning and oil prices are at $130 a barrel. So you're long oil then? In the long term, yes, I am. Yeah. And, and I think that I think we're, I'm long all either actually or, or academically long the entire fossil fuel spectrum, because and I think we'll probably go into this later. But we are putting our eggs to all of our eggs in a EV renewable basket that, that just can't handle it. OK, well, question two was about the conflict. Oh, the conflict and what that could potentially mean with prices? No, it, it absolutely could be because what we do here at Shark, we do a lot of quantitative modeling. Quantitative modeling is great until it's not great. So it works. But the point is, is to try to capture how far, what, what your tail risk is. And once again, your tail risk is based on the logical bounds of, of the variance in markets that we've seen o o over you know, the last 30, 40 years. So, of course, reality could always blow out. Uh, you could always have, and we have had six, seven sigma moves. So we have to be very careful. But what we really utilize a quantitative analysis is that when we do break beyond, say, that third standard deviation along the curve, that is telling us something, obviously, either a headline or something fundamentally is changing in the market. So, of course, the fundamentals with regard to what we're seeing now in Israel is uh, impacting both uh, markets. So in the natural gas market, Israel is a natural gas producer. Uh, immediately when the war broke out, they shuttered or they had Chevron shutter. It's one BCF a day to our uh, oil plat uh, gas platform uh, and shut that production in. So 
that that's interesting because that production goes to Egypt and Egypt liquefies that gas and ships it off to Europe. So now Europe, in addition to all of the gas they've lost because of the Ukraine-Russia war, are, are now beginning to lose. Granted, it, it's a little bit of a drop in the bucket compared to the overall demand picture, uh, supply demand picture. But once again, it is just another driver, another variable out there that Europe has to uh, incorporate. Now, for domestic U.S. Uh, natural gas prices, there's a limit to, to how much geopolitical risk can impact prices because there's a limit to how much we, of natural gas we can ship out in the form of LNG. We're already maxed out on our capacity. So theoretically or logically, what happens around the globe will not impact domestic prices. Not like you know you have a situation around the globe that impacts global uh, an oil market. U.S. markets will react because oil, U.S. oil, is a global a global commodity. U.S. LNG is in that infancy of becoming a global economy. So geopolitics do matter, but and they'll matter even more when capacity grows, and that will occur. So right now, in the here and the now, it's not impacting. So to this point, when we look at natural gas prices in Asia, the basis between those prices and the prices here in the United States using the Henry Hub uh, contract as our marker, Asia prices are 40 percent, have increased 40 percent since the outbreak of the war. Prices in Europe, the Dutch TTF contract, those prices relative to U.S. prices are up 35 percent. And then in the UK, the national balance in point, those prices relative to the U.S. are up 25 percent. So you're, of course, having a greater impact on international prices, but that will change over the next two years. By the end of next year, U.S. LNG export capacity increases by 33 percent. And by the end of 25, where we are today, LNG capacity will increase by another 50 percent. So that's another five to six BCF a day of na domestic natural gas that will be available for export to the global markets taken out of the domestic market. So that said, as we continue to grow as an LNG a superpower, what goes around the globe will now impact natural gas prices. When it comes to crude oil prices, well, as I've said, we're not seeing this yet, but my expressed concern is that it's not priced in. So if we do see and we are seeing an escalation in the Middle East, and this, if this does lead to a wider uh, conflict, look, we already have two U.S. carrier strike groups off the coast of Israel. Great Britain is sending in forces and, and France might also be sending in. A U.S. destroyer already shot out um, drones that were fired to out of Yemen, out of the Houthi terrorists. Now, the theory behind that, interestingly enough, was those rockets coming out of Houthis were designated going into Israel. But sources I've talked to, because no, those are designated for U.S. troops that, that, are, that are still in that region of the world. So God help us if this does spread to a wider war that, that does involve, look, Israel is a known nuclear power. Iran is a aspiring, if not already accomplished, nuclear power. And then, of course, you've got the United States, the UK, so forth. So should this spread, then oil prices have to go higher because we will see the Strait of Hormuz closing is a given. And then if we begin to knock out export facilities, so where can we go? Well, obviously, $100 uh, oil is a given. Uh, there is a certainly a possibility, a good possibility that we'll see oil back in the $130 range, which is where we, we were last year in the first half of 22. And then, of course, we have the records that were set in 2008 with regard to oil pushing up towards $150 a barrel. And now this leads us down a road to real now that we have this supply driver that could push prices higher, but then ultimately that will lead to a demand driver that will have to eventually pull prices down because as we saw in 2008, yes, that recession was a housing recession, but it also coincided with $150 uh, oil, which has a rise in industrial commodities, has always been a driver for economic a downturn. And we saw it this past year in Germany. Germany went into recession because their main BTU to manufacture steel and, and, and all their goods, natural gas prices skyrocketed. So now Germany has gone down the road where 
yeah, guess what? We're going to start burning more coal this winter. We're, and the EU has redesignated natural gas as a green fuel. So there's a myriad of knock-ons here, but certainly it all starts with this conflict. And, and right now the war in Gaza is increasing, but there are you know, Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon, of course, the Houthis out of Yemen, and again, once again, all backed by Iran. So should it increase, then all bets are off and prices it logically have to move higher. It's interesting because when we were talking last year, we were talking about the impact of the war in Ukraine, which is still ongoing. And, and as a sort of side observer, I'm almost thinking, oh, yeah, well, that was that was a far more straightforward conflict. We we could see who the players were. We got an idea that what's going on. It strikes me with what's going on in the Middle East, everybody is almost just waiting to see what happens because nobody's quite sure who's going to do what. Um, is that a, a fair, you know, it's, it's, I don't see us being able to go, oh, we can live with an ongoing conflict in the Middle East, perhaps in the way that we have with, with Ukraine. Yeah, a a absolutely. The powder keg in the Middle East is much more volatile situation. With regard to Russia, Ukraine, yes, uh, Moscow has made a lot of noise about deploying nu nukes and so forth. But I think the logical reasoning on both sides is, is what prevented nuclear war during the Soviet US or Soviet West Cold War. And that was the acronym MAD, Mutually Assured yeah. Destruction. Yeah. So, and, and I think that rationale is the correct rationale when it comes to the Ukraine-Russia war. We, we, we don't know how it's going to end, but I think there's a fair degree of security that it will not get to those catastrophic levels. Yeah. When it comes to the Middle East, when we interject religion, or, or I should say the perversion of religion on both sides, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not beating up on, on either side, but when we see this perversion yeah. of, of religion, this fanaticism, and, and that's a very scary prospect about that what you're seeing. So, and, and you know, the, the kind of the, the world pressure coming in, Israel will make hay while well, the West still backs uh, the incursion. And Israel does not have really, in, in my estimation, a, a, a choice, but this is war. This is not a, I know some countries in the West have said, oh, Israel's response to date has been disproportionate. But come on, people, let's think about this seriously. Would, would a proportionate response by Israel, should, should Israeli IDF go into Gaza and rape as many women as in at the same amount? Is that proportion? Should they behead the same amount, burn the same amount of bodies, families alive? Is that a proportionate response? Uh, of course not. This is an all out war and there is no proportionality that can be applied to this. And so with or without the West, Israel will push on because, again, I don't see any other option that they have. And the more they push, the greater there is of something catastrophic either happening in that area or let's let's you know, let's be real about this. The United States border along Mexico has been open for the past two and a half years. How many terrorist cells have walked across that? And again, I'm staying away from political ideology. This is just logic. We've seen it with the Mexican cartels and, and the amount of opiates and fentanyl that have made it into the United States. It's not unreasonable to think terrorists have also walked across that state. So whether there's a catastrophic event in the Middle East or somewhere in the West, it's very real and it's very scary. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing if we get together in a year's time, this won't still be ongoing in the same format. It's not going to be it's not going to be like Ukraine, is it? No, I, I agree. I, I, John, I, I think that the Ukraine is a slow burn, a war of attrition. And what we're seeing a year from now, I wouldn't be surprised if we're still talking about Ukraine and Russia. But I yeah. think we'll, we'll, we will be talking about something either very positive or, or something that I really don't want to think about. Well, whilst I've got you on this, and it's not it's sort of slightly associated. Just as looking at it, I thought to myself, mm, I'll just have a look at where prices have moved over the past year. And, you know, the traditional model was that there was linkage between oil and gas prices. But the quick look that I, I had shows that there, that doesn't exist in the same way now. That, you know, you can't automatically assume if oil prices go up, gas prices will go up and that they're linked. 
Yeah, absolutely. There, there, were, there was that typical ratio of oil prices relative to gas prices, and they did tend to move in tandem. Yeah. That has been turned over on its head over the past 20 years. Yeah. And uh, for instance, in 2004, Hurricane Ivan, 2005, uh, which up to that date was the most active hurricane season in the North Atlantic, uh, one that, of course, culminated with, with Katrina in late August. And more importantly, as far as the oil and gas markets were concerned, was Hurricane Rita uh, four weeks later, which caused extensively more damage to the U.S. oil and gas infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that mattered uh, because approximately one fifth of lower 48 U.S. gas was sourced out of the shallow water of Gulf of Mexico. Today, less than one twentieth of, of L48 and gas is sourced there, and that is because of the shale gale. So now yeah. in my home state, Pennsylvania, and then of course, Eastern Ohio, Northern West Virginia, uh, is now the epicenter of the global natural gas market. So of course, inoculated from, from severe storms. So what has occurred is what cold, cold winters have, have a more of an impact because you have to shut in natural gas wells to, to withstand that. So that can take supply immediately off the market. So that is more of a volatility driver than hurricanes or 20 years ago. Also impacting, you know, and now with the way LNG or excuse me, natural gas prices will be impacted by hurricanes is shipments coming out of uh, LNG shipments coming out of the export capacity uh, along the Gulf Coast. But first and foremost, what will happen is now, bullish oil prices, back, excuse me, back in the day, bullish oil prices were bullish for natural gas prices. Today, bullish oil prices are bearish for natural gas prices. So what do I mean? Well, outside of the epicenter in the Appalachia natural gas market, your next biggest producer is gas coming out of West Texas. But that is gas we're not even drilling for. We're drilling for oil. So the higher oil prices go, the more domestic producers have to get onto the market. So we've already seen, interestingly enough, a U.S. Get, uh, oil production, which has been in the doldrums for the oh, since COVID mitigation diktats were enacted, all of a sudden over the past month have come to light. And the same week, or the going into the weekend that this war in the Middle East broke out, U.S. oil production hit a record 13.2 million barrels a day. A very, I mean, of course, there's no conspiracy here, but a very odd coincidence that oil prices all of a sudden decided to react. So the more crude oil we're getting on the market, what happens is the crude oil deposits in West Texas also have a lot of natural gas in the same geological formations. So when the crude oil comes out, that gas comes out with it. That's called associated gas with, with the crude oil. And that's not gas we're, we're necessarily consuming, but it is gas that is added to the market. So, so high crude oil prices ha have completely, or the shale revolution has completely turned that old fundamental on its head. And once yeah. again, the higher oil prices go, the more bearish it becomes for domestic gas prices. A great piece of information for our listeners, Stephen, because I'm not sure people would recognize or understand the impact of oil has on natural gas production. And so thank you for, for sharing that. I, I'm still going to stay with natural gas. Sure. And that is the demand for natural gas in Europe has dropped. And for various reasons, we've interviewed a variety of people from Europe talking about because of the high pricing, they started to do different energy efficiency took place about 25% increase in efficiency because price of of gas was so high. So certainly there's less demand for gas. And you've also noted there's some economic reasons why maybe they're not using it. But North America, and you also talked about how North American are actually increasing our LNG. So uh, what does this mean with the reduction in demand in Europe, the increment to LNG from the US? What does that mean to the gas markets for globally and, and quite frankly, North America? I know you touched about it before, but if you could just sure. narrow into that. Yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, when it comes oh. to natural gas, your biggest driver by a long shot is the weather. And what we saw last winter is the market, the, North, the European and the North American markets dodged a bullet for the eastern two thirds of the United States. So from the Rockies all the way to the Atlantic coast, winter never occurred. We had uh, an I-80, which goes from, I think, Piscataway, New Jersey to Wyoming, never had any snow cover, uh, which is quite unbelievable. And the same held for Europe. Europe did not see a winter last year. So that really saved the market. 
And in the natural gas market, whether it's the domestic market or the global market, uh, prices, fundamentals can change. And all it takes is, is one season. So the weather, that is the known unknown. You cannot, just as how hard it is to predict where we're going economically, the weather takes that to, to, a, to a new level. So I, I just wanted to put that caveat out there. So that's the known unknowns. So what are the known knowns? To your point, efficiencies have increased. I haven't seen the numbers, so I cannot refute it, but a 25% increase in, in efficiency inside of a year uh, seems pretty aggressive. So, but I'm not going to argue that. I'm just going to say I do have my doubts and I will go back and research it. Of course, the other demand decay that we've seen in uh, natural gas, yes, is economic. As I said, Germany, Europe's largest economy, went into recession. So, of course, that will be a driver. And then, but we have to go back and look at why are natural gas prices in Europe so high? Yes, the Ukraine war is a reason, but that exacerbated the real reason why natural gas prices. The natural gas prices were already significantly higher before Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. And that was a function of the carbon credit market in, in uh, Europe, which in 2021, uh, the EU decided that the carbon credits, that if you burn a fossil fuel, you have to, you have, to have an offsetting credit. Uh, those credits were too cheap. So it really didn't deter the use of coal that the EU wanted. So what did the EU did? They cut back the number of carbon permits. So obviously you take supply out of a market where demand is still high. Of course, you had a massive spike in carbon prices. And so what did this do? The intent was to push industry away from coal, which the EU succeeded, but it didn't push it into renewables. It pushed it into natural gas. So you had a spike in natural gas prices, which of course were a huge driver. Now, that has been mitigated over the past year because of the growth of the LNG market coming into Europe. So Europe natural gas supplies, just like last year, coming into this winter, are, are at or near uh, max capacity. And that demand is being offset by, yes, the impact of efficiencies, but also, of course, economic doldrums. And, and then the, the substitution of other BTUs. So you have, as I said, you know, nukes that are not being decommissioned. You have coal, which the, I believe Germany is going to reactivate four coal plants coming into this winter. And then last year, Germany was, was chopping down ancient forests to burn wood. And th this is where our policy has taken us. It's we are now burning fuels that have not been a significant source of heat since the 1800s. So, yes, demand I I is lower. But the no, no, no is weather. But the no, no is more coal on the market. What are you predicting for the next 12 months? This is so that we can have you on again in a year's time and go, well, you got that wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Just as, just as long as I'm wrong less than 49% of the time. You're I'm good. With, with that, exactly. So what am I predicting uh, for the next year? Well, to go back to, well, my second favorite Rocky movie, of course, Rocky 1 being, being my favorite, Rocky 3 <laughs> with Clever Lang. When they asked him what his prediction for the fight was, looks into the camera and says, pain. And that's my prediction, pain uh, mm -hmm. in the form of higher volatility. So certainly we, we have this mantra here that somehow cheap gasoline prices, which, which Americans think is an amendment in, in the uh, Constitution, that is never a good sign because industrial commodity prices are, are not driven, or I should say industrial commodity prices do not drive economic growth. Economic uh, growth drives commodity prices. So uh, what I hope to see is prices right around where they are today, which to me, would mean we had some sort of peaceful resolution, what's going on in the Middle East. But no, predictions going forward, barring a, of course, I have to put a caveat out there, barring a, a major uh, downturn in economic activity around the globe, certainly I think there's a greater possibility that oil prices will retrace back up to $100 a barrel. And, you know, coming into this year, my modeling Again, kind of looking at you know, you know that, that that bell curve. My modeling had oil prices ranging this year between ninety five dollars and seventy five dollars, and we've held there even for the first ten months. Now we've had a couple of dips below the mid seventies into the sixties, but but those were short lived. There was a one off 
the last time I believe we had a significant sell-off to those levels was during the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and what this potentially meant for financing and so forth. And there was a resolution to that. Unfortunately, the government is just printing more money to try and resolve that. But the mark that reassured the market and then and oil prices pop, uh, popped up back above uh, the, the mid 70s. And then, of course, now we're in the mid to low 80s right now. So we're holding right within that range. When I run the models now, that range, that, that initial range, we'll, we'll call it that, that, that one standard deviation inside the curve. And, and, and again, if anyone gets you know bent out of shape when I keep on talking about the bell-shaped curve, yes, I am assur- assuming that there is a normal distribution. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's the only distribution uh, we have. So I have to go with that. So I'm going to push, I imagine, and you can hold me to this, but the upper right side bound of that will be oil in that 110 range. I'll still keep the mid 70 on, on the bottom range. And then of course, if we get black swan events, oil well above $150 a barrel. But this year thus far, we've been holding on the bottom end of, that, of, of my modeling in that mid 70, $80 range for mid 70 for WTI, uh, low 80s for, for Brent. We've been holding there on the lower end of, of that range. I suspect we'll, we'll transition back through the median and we'll be pushing up against the the initial uh, upper uh, regions of that range, which would be 105 to 110. And then of course, if we break there, psychologically, the market is going to take a shot at 100, the highs that we saw last year, and then ultimately the record highs that we saw in 2008. And, and my concern, as we said earlier, or you said earlier, Stephen, is like you, I've been around a few of these cycles myself. And if that price remains, it goes to that level, I do worry about the economy there afterwards because of that. Yeah, I just I just want, you know, and, and that, that's an excellent point, but it, it's very interesting what has happened with the elasticity of, of demand and price. For oil, and, and, and I'll, you know, we don't consume oil. Only refineries consume crude oil. We consume what comes out of those refineries, gasoline. And what we saw with our studies in 2008, or when prices really started to take off around 2004 and so forth, is that $3.60, $3.80 at the pump seemed to be that tipping point that, 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 that you started to see a pullback in demand. Now, gasoline, the elasticity, has always been rather, or the inelasticity has o of demand has always been rather consistent because while there are two factors that impact price, the, the first factor, of course, is is price volatility. So, but given that we still at the time we still we don't do it now, but we still had to drive to our offices, we still had to drive the kids to school, so forth. The demand was the demand. And we lack that second variable to impact price. And that, of course, is the substitute. And we didn't have substitutes in 2008. Of course, today we do have substitutes, be it full electrics or what I drive, an electric hybrid. So I would think that, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm here uh, for a bit in Los Angeles. And, and the prices here are, in certain areas in Orange County, $7 a gallon. But when I think about it, in 2008, I drove a large SUV that got about 300 yards to the gallon. So yes, when, when, <laughs> I, when I paid $100 to fill that beast up that every week, that was painful. But today I drive an electric plug-in electric hybrid where it's only a 17 gallon tank. But when I'm driving around town, I'm never burning gasoline. I'm only burning gasoline when we take a road trip. So when I'm not taking road trips, I'm getting 14, 1500 miles before I have to refill up those 17 gallons. And even if I'm taking road trip, I get a minimum of 700 gallons. So whereas I was paying 100 and 120, we all were paying 100 and 120 dollars a gallon in 2008 and causing a lot of economic pain. Today, I'll spend 120 dollars, but that might be every three months. So inside of spending 12 uh, weeks at $100, I'm spending $100 every three months. So I'm really, and people that drive electric plug-in, they're not as exposed 
uh, to these prices. So just because we can get to $130, $150 a barrel, and of course, what that means for the knock-on for people who drive electric hybrids or who drive all EVs right now, that is impacting the elasticities of price. And so perhaps we don't know because this is as we push more and more down that road towards away from internal combustion engines, we don't know what that inflection point of how high oil prices can go before it causes serious demand constraints on consumers, which of course consumers making up 70%, 7-0 of the US economy. That is the big known unknown, how high prices can go before economic calamity occurs. Excellent point. So all we've got to look forward to is pain. <laughs> yes, indeed. I, I, I think that will be uh, because regardless of what I said, regardless of the change in price and, and how we've elongated the impact of higher prices, uh, people will always complain about uh, gasoline prices. Not, and now, mind you, uh, gasoline prices today are no more expensive than they were in the early 1980s at the outbreak of the Iraq-Iran war after we adjust for inflation. But Americans especially will complain that prices today are as expensive as, as they were 40 years ago. Then again, 40 years ago, we weren't paying $7 for, uh, for a latte or, or buying our, our water. So we've learned to spend the money elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. There is theoretical that, that, that gasoline prices are too high, but really, do you want to go back to earning what you were earning in 1980? Do you want your house to, to be as valuable today as it was in 1980? Of course you don't. So you have to expect that knock on to other commodity prices, but gasoline is always the, the one that yeah. uh, is demagogued in the, industry, uh, well, in the media and of course by government. Well, on that positive note, that brings us to the end of this episode. And thank you so much, Dave, John, and Stephen, for your time this week. Great. Great to be here, guys. Thank you very much. That's all for today's episode of the 360 on Energy and Carbon podcast. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check us out on our website at 360energy.net and follow us on LinkedIn at 360 Energy Inc. Tune in to our podcast on Apple Music, Spotify, Anchor, or other listening platforms by searching the 360 on Energy and Carbon. You can watch the video recording and subscribe on YouTube at 360 Energy Inc. Email us your feedback at podcast at 360energy.net or comment on our LinkedIn posts.